Over the last 60 years, Doctor Who has given us some amazing characters and some truly astonishing stories. From one-off belters like Blink, to more complex storylines that span across multiple seasons such as the River Song story arc. These moments remind us just how astonishing this wibbly wobbly series can be. But it goes without saying that with that many decades worth of content, there are always going to be moments that don't quite hit the mark. Well with that in mind, I'm Ellie with Who Culture here with 10 simple fixes that would have improved Doctor Who. Number 10. Film the Doctor and River's confrontation at the same time as the impossible astronaut. When Series 6 opened with a mysterious astronaut rising from Lake Silencio and shooting the Doctor dead, there was universal confusion as to who was in the spacesuit. By the time the wedding of River Song aired, the pieces had been put together to reveal that it was River, trapped in a pre-programmed suit by the silence. Now, the impossible astronaut version of that scene was filmed on location in Utah, but the Wedding of River Song version was filmed at a later date in a studio with the use of a green screen, and a rather shoddy green screen at that, with these really unconvincing visuals distracting from what should have been the most engaging and emotional moment of the entire series. And that's not to mention the blatant lack of continuity. Now in the original version, the astronaut opens the visor with one green fingertipped gloved hand, but River opens it with two hands which suddenly change colour from green to clear. The Doctor's hair is completely different, the reflection in the visor also different, and the mountains in the background are different between the two shots. Now there's a really simple fix to these issues. Film both versions of that scene whilst on location in Utah. Understandably, there were some very valid reasons why they didn't do this. Firstly, both episodes had different directors, but for a tiny little scene like that, that really shouldn't have made much of a difference. But more importantly, there was a real fear of spoilers being leaked, as fans had spotted the filming in Utah and they really didn't want that reveal of who was in the spacesuit to be leaked, and obviously we all know how River Song feels about spoilers. Number 9. Actually show Jack's resurrection abilities in Revolution of the Daleks. When Captain Jack Harkness first took that second breath of new life in Parting of the ways, it opened a new chapter in the Time Agent's life. From that moment on, he could no longer die, or rather, he couldn't stay dead. His ability to resurrect himself became a handy tool when trying to force the hand of a menacing alien, or to trick his way into or out of places he shouldn't be. That iconic gasp of new life became the character's signature move, being showcased at least once in almost every episode of Doctor Who he appeared in. Imagine then the disappointment fans felt when Captain Jack made his long-awaited and highly anticipated return in Revolution of the Daleks, only to remain alive and kicking throughout the entire runtime. Now it's fair to say that fans were expecting him to dramatically die and come back to life at least once during that episode, and he even spoke to Yaz, Graham and Ryan about his resurrection abilities, which really felt like Chris Chibnall was setting that seed ready for a future scene. But that scene never came. Captain Jack's deaths are among his most iconic moments in Doctor Who, and it was actually quite disappointing when another one wasn't delivered. And considering how many Daleks were in that episode, it would have been pretty simple to script one. Number 8. Tone down the design of the new paradigm Daleks. The Daleks are as iconic to Doctor Who as the TARDIS and the titular Time Lord. The evil foe that torments the Doctor throughout their life, always wreaking havoc and always finding a way to survive. The most important element of an iconic symbol like this is a maintained design across the decades. Although there have been some minor alterations to the Daleks design over the years, the overall layout remains the same. Metallic casing, round nose and toilet plunger arms. The most daring upgrade came in Series 5 with the new Paradigm Daleks. And while the overall shape remained the same, the bright new colours and larger size did not receive praise from fans. Placed next to even the World War II camouflage design, these bold giants seemed too cheerful and lacked the steely cold aura of these soulless creatures. Now, the simple solution here would have been to stick more closely with what worked, making the new Paradigm Daleks just slightly less vibrant and slightly less chunky. Even Stephen Moffat admitted that these were a mistake. He said, When I looked at them in person, I thought, my god, the new Daleks are awesome, they're so huge and powerful, they're brilliant. But I learned a grave lesson, which is that when you put them on screen, of course they don't look bigger, they just make all the other Daleks look smaller. Even the man responsible for this new design can admit that it was a mistake, then you know that it didn't work. 
And it is no surprise then that these Scaro Skittles were barely seen again after this episode. Number 7. Make Swarm Azure and the Grand Serpent one character The events of Flux sent the Doctor in all different directions to find answers and solutions. The story did at times feel rather jumbled and busy, which is perhaps why the big bads of the series seemed to lose their steam almost as soon as they got going. Now, Flux was already in an unfortunate position with its reduced episode count, and there was already so much to cover. You had Belle and Vinda, you had Jericho, Claire and the Weeping Angels, you had Carvanista, Dan and Diane, you had the Sontarans, you had Tek Yoon, you had the Division, and that's just a few. All of those main plotlines going on, it just felt like everything was incomplete, or at least rushed to an ending. And with regards to those big bads, Swarm Azure and the Grand Serpent, it probably would have been better for the series to have a single, consistent, memorable villain as opposed to those three characters who all fell short of the mark. The best candidate would have been Swarm, since Azure felt more like a henchman anyway. Swarm definitely had potential to be a truly remarkable villain, but was seemingly dismissed in exchange for the Grand Serpent halfway through the series. Now, it was a bit jarring, to say the least, to suddenly be introduced to this whole new, seemingly disconnected story about the origins of Unit right in the middle of all those other storylines. And even worse, the Grand Serpent was just left on an asteroid at the end of the series, almost as if Chris Chibnall didn't know what to do with him. Now, imagine that same plotline, but with Swarm, who we'd already spent two episodes getting to know as the mastermind instead of the Grand Serpent. The audience probably would have been more engaged with that, and then that plotline would have felt more closely linked to the main events of the series. Number 6. Don't shoot the Absorbal off in broad Daylight. Love of Monsters is considered almost universally one of Modern Who's weakest episodes. The first of many stories to follow the Doctor Companion light format, it received very divisive opinions from fans. Some applauded the offbeat structure of the episode, while others criticised it for feeling like a parody rather than a proper episode of the show. Now, the overall storyline actually showed great potential. But the main gripe viewers had was the questionable design of Peter Kay's Absorbaloff. Extremely grotesque in premise, but rather laughable and false looking in its execution. Now, it must be acknowledged that this creature was designed by the winner of a Blue Peter competition, but still, one cannot help but criticise the final masterpiece. Now, of course, in the classic era of Doctor Who, the costumes and makeup were much simpler, and they lacked the budget or the technology of modern visual effects. But you would think that a creature that was created in the same year as the Ood and the Clockwork Men would be just slightly more refined. But there is one simple fix that would have at least helped to make the Absorbaloff just be a little bit more intimidating and slightly less rubber looking. Shoot those scenes with more shadows and dimmer lighting. By simply adding an element of ominous mystery and darkness, the Absorbaloff could have actually been much scarier. But at the very least, they could have given him some pants. Number 5. Give Dalek a different episode title it was only a matter of time before Russell T Davies would bring the Daleks into his 2005 reboot, and the Ninth Doctor episode, aptly titled Dalek, marked the much-anticipated return of Doctor Who's most iconic monster. The episode centred around the last surviving Dalek of the Time War, and the consequences of it absorbing energy from Rose in order to repair itself. The premise of an emotionless cold machine developing compassion and hopelessness in the wake of a long, devastating war was a great avenue to explore with the Daleks, and the episode did a remarkable job of switching those dynamics around to show the Doctor as the merciless monster rather than the Dalek. What was slightly disappointing though was the lack of mystery or surprise surrounding the episode. The big reveal of the Dalek is treated like some massive twist, but it's literally there in the title, and that left nothing up to the imagination and kind of ruined that big reveal. Imagine that same episode but with a more ambiguous title. Something that hints towards that big surprise, but also maintains an innocence, like Metaltron or something like that. Now, really, it's an unrealistic change to make, because it would have been foolish for them to hide the Daleks in the lead up to series one. But just imagine how chilling it would have been to have learned of the Daleks' survival in the exact same moment that the Doctor does. Number 4. Introduce Mel's before Let's Kill Hitler Let's Kill Hitler was an episode filled with surprises, not least of all the revelation that Amy and Rory's childhood best friend Mel's was in fact their long-lost daughter, Melody Pond, 
aka River Song. Towards the beginning of the episode, we were treated to a montage that showed the trio growing up together and the parental role that Amy and Rory still managed to play in Melody's life, as well as the strong interest Mel's took in the Doctor. Although it is often easy to forget, of course the Doctor's companions had a whole life before they met this madman with a box, and so it was great to see them hanging out with their more normal friends. What didn't make sense though is that Mel's is supposedly Amy and Rory's oldest and closest friend, and yet the audience had never seen her before Let's Kill Hitler. Now, although her absence from their wedding was explained away with her saying that she doesn't do weddings, it did then make it hard to believe that she was as close to them as they proclaim. And there's a really simple fix for this, which would have been to just add a brief scene between the three of them at the beginning of the series. And there was the perfect opportunity for this at the beginning of The Impossible Astronaut, when we saw Amy and Rory in their everyday life before they went to America. So why not add a birthday party scene, or a dinner, or even just a shot of Mel's leaving their house before the postman arrives with the invitation from the doctor? Hell, even just mentioning her name would have at least been something. Number 3. Have the 13th Doctor reassure Graham with a hug. The closing moments of Can You Hear Me included a touching, heartfelt moment between the 13th Doctor and Graham. Or more accurately, Graham opened up to the Doctor about the fear of his cancer coming back, and the Doctor just shuffled away awkwardly. By her own admission, she can be socially awkward, and we know that the Doctor has a history of struggling with acts of affection. See Eleven's wavy hands when River kisses him for the first time, or Twelve saying he's not a hugger in deep breath. But this particular moment just felt rather insensitive and actually resulted in the BBC receiving multiple complaints about the way in which the Doctor responded to Graham's confession, and eventually they issued a statement which explained, the intention of this scene was to acknowledge how hard it can be to deal with conversations on this subject matter. When faced with these situations, people don't always have the right words to say at the right time. By showing the Doctor struggling to find the right words, the intention was to sympathise with all those who may have found themselves in a similar position. In this particular situation, we can't help but feel that it would have been more appropriate for the Doctor to just simply give Graham a hug. No additional dialogue was needed, just a simple gesture to let him know that he has people who care about him. And actually, it could have been a moment to show growth in the Doctor, heeding 12's departing instructions to laugh hard, run fast, be kind. I mean, what's kind than giving Graham a hug in his moment of need. Number two, don't show the weeping angels moving. The weeping angels are without doubt some of the scariest monsters in Doctor Who. The entire premise of a statue hunting you in the dark and killing you with time is arguably more terrifying than just a grotesque creature with a gun. One of the most intimidating elements of the angels is the way they approach their victims, jumping forward with each flash of darkness as their mouths widen and their arms raise. Part of the fear factor comes from never actually seeing them physically move. When light shines upon them, they are still as a statue. Yes, pun intended. And so we only ever see them progressing forward in unseen jumps. That is, until the Series 5 episode Flesh and Stone. Although the majority of the episode does show the angels moving in their normal way, there's one moment where we see them slowly turning their heads as they approach Amy. Now, arguably, the reason that we can see them moving here is because Amy has her eyes closed closed, and so technically they're unseen, but for the audience this kind of ruined that ominous element of how they move, and merely reminded us that they're just performers in costumes. So the simple fix here would have been to maintain that ambiguity of the Weeping Angels. Simply remove those scenes of the slow human-like movement, and make better use of flashes and faster cuts to build up that tension even further. When the Weeping Angels attack, the audience needs to feel like they cannot blink. But all this scene really did is make them roll their eyes. Number 1. The Tenth Doctor visits Joan Redfern, not her great-granddaughter. The final moments of the end of time saw the Tenth Doctor embarking on a farewell tour, revisiting his friends and companions for one last time before he regenerated. Now, most of the people in that lineup made absolute sense friends that have played important parts in his tenth life. But there is one amongst those that doesn't make sense, and that is the great-granddaughter of Joan Redfern. Now, of course, Joan Redfern played a very important part in the short-lived human life of John Smith, 
and it cannot be denied that the Doctor experienced great feelings for her. Whether those final feelings were that of continued love or the guilt of breaking her heart remains to be seen. Perhaps it's both. So of course it does make sense that in his final hours he'd wish to learn what became of her. Whether she was happy, whether she remembered the time they shared together. But what doesn't make sense is that he sought these answers out from her great-granddaughter rather than from Joan herself. Now there are some who believe that this scene should have been removed entirely, but there are two simple fixes that could have at least made it make more sense. Firstly, the Doctor has a time machine. So why not simply travel back in time and find out those answers for himself? He needn't have interfered, just observed from afar. Or if travelling back in time was too risky, why not visit Joan as an old lady? We've seen a similar concept to this in a deleted scene from The Unicorn and the Wasp when the Doctor and Donna visit an elderly Agatha Christie. Now this would have removed that risk of interfering with her timeline and altering her life, but it would have given Ten the closure that he needed. Instead, he questions a woman who couldn't possibly know how Joan truly felt, which just was very odd. And that concludes our list. If you think we missed any then do let us know in the comments below. And while you're there don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell so you never miss a Who Culture video. Also head over to Twitter and follow us there and I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Little Child. I've been Ellie with Who Culture and in the words of Riversong herself, goodbye sweeties.